Yeah, so yeah, confounding variable and then treatment. So yeah, just to rerun that again, we have our explanatory variable, which is um, explaining the difference in our response variable. It's um, independent, not ex it's not um, impacted by anything. Our response variable is dependent upon our explanatory variable. And um, then our confounding variable is going to be that, which, um, you know, it's like a third variable that affects the other um, variables that we're trying to look at. So we don't want the confounding variable. And then lastly, the treatment is just, that's what we talk about in um, experiments, which we'll talk about a little bit later. That's just talking about um, if we were to impose some sort of treatment on our subjects, that means it's an experiment um, that we're trying to change something about them and then study what happens when we make that change. All right, and then so another thing about variables, this is how we discuss variables in terms of if they're doing like labels or if they have values attached to them. So categorical variables are going to be those labels or groupings. I always use examples of um, like flavors, colors, car brands, um, anything like that that just doesn't have like numbers attached to it. And then we have nominal and ordinal and uh, nominal are going to be the ones that basically they can take on any um, order so they can be um, for example, like car brands can be a nominal variable because, you know, one car brand doesn't come before another one. Um, ordinal is still going to be categorical, so it's still categories, but in this case it is going to be, um, there has to be some sort of hierarchy to it. So this would be something like class standings, like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Those are categorical variables, but they do have hierarchy in them, which is why we consider them ordinal variables. And then our quantitative variables are going to be the variables that have um, numbers with consistent intervals. That's basically saying that they have some sort of value to them on a number line. Discrete means that they can only take on a set number of values. So that's going to be our, um, that, that's anything that's like things that can't be like split up maybe. So like people, um, cars, those would be discrete quantitative variables. And then continuous variables are going to be variables that can take on any value on the number line. So a lot of measurement variables such as like weight, height, um, you know, centimeters, inches, any of that, those are usually going to be continuous variables there. Okay, and then, um, so I just want to talk about some sampling issues that can happen that we talked about conceptually. Just we have our um, low response rate. So this is just saying that if, you know, we put out a survey or whatnot and then a lot of people don't respond. So then basically our sample size is going to be small. So that's not really going to give us a representative sample of the, um, a representative sample of the population. Um, and then non-response bias is going to be, uh, it's similar in the way that, you know, not a lot of people respond, but it's, it's more so it doesn't have to be like a small amount to respond. It could, it's basically like the group that we're trying to study isn't going to respond. So um, that's not response bias. So low response rate just means like not no one really responded, not too many people. Non-response means that like an important group didn't um, didn't get back to us. And then those are th that's going to skew our data, obviously, because then they're not part of our sample that we're looking at. Um, question wording issues. This is just saying that. Um, when we're talking about when you write a research question or when you write a question on a survey, you want to make sure that it doesn't have certain things that can sway the people, you know, from one side to the other in terms of, you know, being, um, you know, being biased towards something or it's kind of like encouraging them to answer one way or another. Um, so we did talk about this in one of the other videos. So I would go back. We went a little bit more in depth for these um, with, the, you know, unnecessary complexity, um, asking the uninformed, filtering, that kind of thing. Um, so there's just some issues that you can have with them um, when you're wording questions. So these are things to keep in mind because statistics is very applicable to obviously real life and research and anything that you're doing to find out information. So you want to make sure that you avoid these things and also things like confounding variables like we just talked about. Okay, so experimental and observational studies. So for our experimental studies, this is what I was talking about earlier, the manipulation and the treatment. So the researcher is going to impose some sort of treatment on the group. Uh, they're going to, you know, for example, like if you have a group of people that you're trying to see if a drug works on them, you're giving them the drug, you're imposing a treatment. Um, and then random, ra randomized experiment is what we want because that's going to mean that everything's kind of by, uh, it's made by chance. Uh, there wasn't like any sort of, uh, you know, deliberate bias or anything that the researcher was trying to do to get to that. Um, so we also call it a scientific study. You'll see those words used um, interchangeably. So um, so yeah, that's experimental studies and then observational means that there's no manipulation at all. So that means that it's natural state of affairs, nothing is changing, um, and data is going to be collected without the researcher doing anything. I usually just say it's people watching. That's a good way to liken it too. So 
Okay, and then we have reliability. So reliability is just talking about how consistent our, um, our data are. So if we're talking about if things, you know, if you do a study and you do it again and you do it again, how consistent are those results? Um, so, and remember I talked about earlier, if you know, you have like non-response bias or low response rate, that's gonna give you a small sample size, which means it's not gonna be representative of our population. So that means that we are gonna have low reliability because um, we're probably not going to get the same consistent, um, you know, answer every single time. It's probably going to be very, um, very, very variable. That's a good one. So, okay, so we have um, our margin of error then is just something we talked about. This is basically saying the area, um, you know, on our number line or whatever we're looking at that we're kind of accepting, um, that's where an error could occur in there. And the, um, that's the equation for it, 1 divided by square root of n, our sample size. And because it's in that form too, it does have an inverse relationship with sample size. So once again, you know, if we increase our margin of error or increase our sample size, margin of error will go down. Another reason why we want that large sample size. And then um, in contrast, we do have, if you decrease the margin of error, then we do, um, sorry, decrease the sample size, we do increase the margin of error there. So just things to keep in mind. Okay. Um, so yeah, we, we talked a little bit about this, so non-probability sampling. So this is um, similar, think about this more so, similar to like an observational study because it's basically um, the easiest way to get um, samples, to get people to respond. So you'll have a volunteer sample, which means that basically people um, are gonna just choose, like they're gonna respond if they want to or not. So the issue with this is that, you know, maybe only the people who are really passionate about the issue are gonna respond, um, and the, the ones that aren't, aren't gonna respond. So that's not representative of the population, it's just representative of you know, one group of people who, so that's bias there. Um, convenient samples, that just means whatever's easiest. You know, if I'm trying to find information out about all the you know, people at Hershey Park, but I only ask the people who are at the one restaurant I'm at right at the moment, that's gonna be a convenient sample and that's obviously not representative either. So that's why non-probability sampling isn't um, the preferred method, but these are ideas that you wanna understand just so you know that they are things that go on there. All right, and we did talk a little bit about um, measurement data display. So when we are, when we have a bunch of our variables, if we're, for this example, we're gonna talk about quantitative first. So when we have quantitative variables, we can display them. Um, here's two different ways we can. So either our histogram or our dot plot, it's really just showing, um, you know, whatever value you're looking for on the x-axis and the frequency of that value is represented either in the dots or in the histogram. Um, histogram is better for larger, um, larger sample sizes because you can fit you know as many as you want in the, as long as you scale it correctly on the y-axis in those bars um, and the bars do touch there so keep that in mind and then um, disadvantage though um, the individual observations aren't specified like they are on the dot plot the dot plot you can literally point out each observation which in terms of the histogram you can't um, so it just depends on the situation and the context of your um, experiment to know what you um, which one of them you would want to use Okay, and talking a little bit more about our um, about the quantitative variables. So when we have a quantitative variable that's talking about our, um, and we put it like on a distribution, so it could be on the dot plot, a histogram, whatever. Um, for mean equals our median, which equals our mode, that means it's gonna be symmetrical. Um, if our mean is less than our median, which is less than our mode, that's gonna be our left skew. And then mode less than median, less than mean is a right skew. So that just goes along with the different graphs that we have um, when we see them look like that, so. All right, and then just a few more uh, measurement data displays. So we also talk about this once again in terms of quantitative variables. So we do have, these are the same thing. The only difference is box, side by side box plot. This has two groups here. The top one only has one. Um, so it's, it's a good way to represent um, kind of the five number summary, if you remember. So we have our minimum and our maximum and then Q1, Q2, Q3. Um, Q2 is always our median. So that's just a box plot is a good way to represent that. The middle, the, the box is uh, the middle 50% of the data. And like I said, that line in the middle is always gonna be your median and then obviously your max and your min. So that's um, usually what we use it to do is um, if we want to describe percentiles and the quartiles and whatnot, um, we would use a box plot. And remember these, both of these are for quantitative data displays. And like I said, the only difference with the bottom one is that there's two groups instead of just one, which there is in the top one. Okay, so standard scores, basically what standard scores are talking about is um, where your observation that you got stands in relation to other observations that there are. So 
the equation that we use to find standard score is also called a z-score, is value minus mean divided by our standard deviation. So um, your value is going to be the observed value that you got. So when you took the sample, that's the observed value that you got. And then minus the mean, so this is going to be whatever mean you're given, um, you know, of your population that you're trying to find out. And then divide, divided by that standard deviation, um, which is your spread, remember. And that's going to give you your standard score there. Um, so it's showing you where whatever point you got, and it's standardizing it onto a z-curve, and then showing where it is in relation to the other ones, okay? All right. And this is just, once again, the empirical rule is our, um, is kind of what we base our standardized scores off of. So we do have, you know, this normal curve here, and then we, um, you know, we place the different values here on the x-axis, so um, to standardize the score. So um, remember, empirical rule is saying that plus or minus one standard deviation is going to be 68% uh, of the data, and then plus or minus two is 95%, and then obviously three is 99.7, so almost all of the graph there. So that's the empirical rule. I would just keep that in mind um, and understand it conceptually. Uh, so you, you know, so it makes sense in terms when we use it, um, you know, an application. Um, okay, and yeah, case control studies. This is basically just talking about: Are you looking at a study um, of people that, like currently have the disease, or you're trying to like follow people who have it um, like over time? So. So for example, so retrospective, you're comparing patients who currently have the disease like right now, and then to compare them to people who don't have the disease right now. And then you wanna figure out, you know, things about like when did, it, like time of onset, you know, um, what were their past exposures? Did they have behaviors that contributed to either health issue? And then prospective, that's looking forward. Um, so it's basically taking people at, you know, with different exposures, and behaviors at the moment so they, they don't have the disorder yet but they have different um, exposures to the um, whatever they're trying to find out about that variable and then you follow them over time so perspectives looking forward you follow them over time retrospective is taking a group right now and looking in the past and trying to figure out um, what caused them to be where they are today so that's what those ones are all right, so let's do some review questions here. So um, suppose there are two methods to test the amount of milk fat in 2% milk. The results of five trials for each method on the same milk shipment are shown below. So when you look at these results from method one and two, which one do you think is the most reliable? So go ahead and type your answer in the chat box and then we will review it together. Okay, so remember, we want to keep in mind that when something's reliable, that means it's going to be consistent, okay? So our answer, actually, we want to make sure it's going to be method one because these numbers are the most consistent out of all of them. Um, you know, as you see, for each different um, trial, they got the same number. So that means it's going to be a reliable um, study there. For method two, they got different numbers every time. And I mean, it's, they're still close, but, um, you know, between them, we'd say that method one is the most reliable because they got the same um, the same number on each of them. Does that make sense why method one would be your answer? Cool. <laughs> All right, no, yeah, no problem. Well, good, I'm glad you understand. All right, so let's try this one. So a poll of 1,000 respondents taken in Tennessee population 6.5 million to determine the percentage of adults that in that state who walked at least a full mile in the previous week. Second poll of 2,000 respondents is taken in Illinois, the population of 13 million, to determine the percentage of adults in that state who hadn't walked or who had walked at least a mile in the previous week. Um, 
Since the sample size and population size were both twice as big in the Illinois poll, what will we expect? So read through these answers, let me know what you think, and we will review it together. Okay, good. So in this case, so remember that our population is going to be our um, our fixed variable while our, or not our fixed variable, it's going to be fixed. And then our um, sample size, or excuse me, our sample is going to be the one that changes, okay? So in this case, remember when I talked about um, how margin of error has an inverse relationship with sample size? Um, so that means that you know when the sample, or yeah, when our sample size goes up, our margin of error decreases. Um, but it says, so since the Tennessee poll had a smaller sample size, it's going to have a larger margin of error. So our answer is actually going to be A here um, for that reason, because um, if you look, so this is talking about, this is basically like the opposite of what it said. So, um, so if you see Tennessee had a smaller um, population, so that means it's going to have a larger margin of error. Illinois poll had a larger population. So that's going to have a smaller um, margin of error there. So that's why A is correct. The Tennessee poll would have a larger margin of error um, than the Illinois poll because it has a smaller population up here. Does that make sense to everybody? Woohoo. Raise the roof. All right. All right. Let's try this one. So suppose that in a five number summary, you find that a larger gap exists between the third quartile and the highest value than between the lowest value in the first quartile. What does this most likely say about the shape of the distribution of the data? So let me know what you think and we will go over it together. Great job. Yeah, so our answer here is going to be ah, B. Uh, so remember, when we have, um, so it's going to be skewed to the right. I don't know what my thing is doing. Okay. Um, so that means that when the higher values, remember, um, are more spread out than the lower values, that's what's skewed to the right um, ends up meaning at the end of the day. So um, if I were to draw one that's skewed to the right, um, see our, our higher values are more spread out down here. So that's where, um, so, and that's, see in the five number summary, and this is, remember I talked about that you draw box plots a lot for a five number summary. So you have your box plot here, and that's saying that the larger gap exists between the third quartile and the highest value than between the lowest value and the first quartile. So that means that it might look something like this. So once again, the values are more spread out down here. So that's why it would be skewed to the right. So good job, you guys definitely understand that one.
Oh, someone's beeping outside. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's. <laughs> all right. A Penn State poll wants to determine what percent of all PSU students favor university policy about. Sorry, about parking on campus. A random sample of 1,000 students was obtained from a list of all students who live on campus. What is the major problem with this survey? So go ahead and try this one out. I'll go see who's beeping outside and, and we'll go over together. Okay, so for this one, oops, okay, so yeah, the answer is A in this one, so good job. So when we're talking about this, it's saying, if you think about this poll excluded, you know, all the students who live off campus, commute to class, because it's only talking about the people who, like, who live on campus, but there's so many other students, obviously, um, and the population of interest was a percent of all Penn State students, so if you only check the ones who live on campus, you're forgetting about everyone else um, who doesn't live on campus, so that's why your answer is A, because um, you used the wrong sampling frame there, basically. It's not representative of your population. It's not a volunteer sample. It was random, and then C also is not a convenient sample, because they didn't really mention that that's, like, all they had access to or anything, so the answer is A. Great job. All right, oh, here we go. All right, let's do one more here. All right, so which of the following is a research strategy that involves a researcher manipulating the participant's environment in some way? So just go ahead and try to answer this one and we will go over it together. All right, good. So, yep, you guys are correct. So our answer is going to be B here um, because the rest of them that aren't B, so <laughs> A, C, and D, those are all going to be um, types of either observational studies or, like I said, a sample survey. Um, remember that um, the manipulation happens when we have an experiment, um, randomized experiment. So that's going to be our answer there for B. I'm not sure what's going on in my neighborhood right now. Everything's okay. All right, so yeah, our answer is B, so good job. You guys definitely understand that. It's a good concept to definitely have down. All right, so yeah, so you guys uh, can go ahead and check out this recording and the other ones on the YouTube channel. Our next session for um, starting up for the, after the next exam is gonna be for um, next Thursday, the 18th already at 8.30. Um, so yeah, if you guys haven't given me your Pensy email, I think everyone did, but so thank you for that. If you have any other questions about um, content for the midterm, let me know. And if not, you guys are good to go for today.